From Sarasota Memorial, this is HealthCast. A healthy dose of information from experts you can trust. Hi everyone, welcome to HealthCast. I'm Allison Gottermeyer. Thank you so much for joining us today as we discuss vertigo and tinnitus and treatments available right here at Sarasota Memorial. Our guest today, Dr. Jack Wazin, who is the Chief of Staff and Medical Director of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Sarasota Memorial. Dr. Wazin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So Dr. Wazin, an important question to just start this conversation, of course, is what is vertigo? Vertigo is the sensation of movement, typically a spinning sensation. You feel like you're on a merry-go-round. It comes suddenly, and it comes typically with a feeling of nausea and loss of equilibrium. It could last for seconds to minutes to hours to days. So what is the difference exactly between vertigo, dizziness, imbalance? I know these get interchanged quite a bit. That is true, and it's very important to determine the exact nature of the symptom so that we could provide our patient with the right testing, the right examination, and the right diagnosis, and the right treatment. So as I said, vertigo is that spinning sensation. Dizziness is a feeling of lightheadedness, uh, almost fainting sensation, giddiness in the head. Patients tend to specifically say, yes, I have spinning, I have vertigo, or not. It's easier to describe vertigo because of that spinning sensation. It's more difficult to describe dizziness or lightheadedness. Everyone describes it in their own vocabulary, but it is not the sensation of spinning. And that's an important differentiation in the cause of symptoms. And the other type of symptom that we talk about is called disequilibrium or imbalance. And in those individuals say, I'm fine if I'm sitting down, I'm fine in bed, if I'm not moving, I'm okay. It's when I get up to walk that I feel like I'm walking like a drunk or I cannot walk a straight line or I need to hang on to somebody. So these are three different categories of balance disorders, vertigo, dizziness, disequilibrium, that are diagnosed differently and treated differently. So what testing is necessary to determine vertigo versus imbalance or dizziness? Vertigo is typically an inner ear symptom. So when somebody says, I have episodes of vertigo with periods of normalcy in between, you're thinking mainly an inner ear disorder. Of course, there are brain disorders that could also cause vertigo, but the majority of vertigo is inner ear based. When we look at dizziness, it could be anything. It could be low blood sugar, low blood pressure, uh, poor circulation in the brain, inner ear problems. So the diagnosis or the testing and the workup for general dizziness is much more extensive and complex than just vertigo, where we could test the inner ear systems per se. And of course, the equilibrium, uh, disequilibrium condition uh, also requires a more detailed workup because it could be inner ear problems, could be brain problems, or it could be musculoskeletal problems, meaning joint issues, uh, arthritic issues, uh, spinal cord issues, and so on. How common is vertigo itself? Vertigo is very common. Actually, the most common type of vertigo, which, you know, almost everybody gets at one point or another, is called positional vertigo, benign positional vertigo. And that's vertigo that happens when you look up to get something from a high shelf, bend over to the floor, or when you lie down, put your head on the pillow, or go to a doctor for a physical exam, they put you down or to go for, to get a scan, you lie down and the whole room spins. And it spins for a few seconds and then it stops and it will spin again when you change your position again. 
is called benign positional vertigo, and it's due to floating crystals in the inner ear fluids where typically they do not belong. We all have crystals. They sit in a chamber in the inner ear to give our brain the sense of gravity. When they fall off base and they float in the fluid, they cause positional vertigo. That's very common and it is easily treated. Most people respond very quickly with certain maneuvers to reposition those crystals where they belong. So what causes all of vertigo? Because there are other types of vertigo, as you mentioned, and, and how can it be treated? Well, vertigo is a symptom. It's not a disease. Mm -hmm. It's a symptom that something is not right. So I said positional vertigo is one type of vertigo that is due to floating crystals. Mm -hmm. Another common type of vertigo is called Meniere disease. Meniere disease, more severe vertigo, it lasts for minutes to hours, and the attacks are stronger, they last, and they cause nausea, vomiting. In severe cases, they could also cause diarrhea. You cannot walk if you're having an attack of vertigo like this. You're, you're down, you're in bed, or you're on the floor, or you're crawling to the bathroom because of the vomiting that it produces. Meniere disease is an inner ear disease. It's not just vertigo, it also includes loss of hearing in one or both ears, typically one, fullness and pressure in the ear, and tinnitus, which is the ringing or buzzing in the ear. And it comes in attacks, it's recurrent. So you get the attack, it lasts whatever attack it, it lasts, and then it stops, you could be better in a day or two. You could be fine for a month or a year or a week, and it could happen again. It's unpredictable when it can happen again. Those are inner ear disorders, Meniere disease, due to increased inner ear pressure from fluid buildup in the inner ear compartment. We diagnose it with hearing testing and balance testing and we treat it with medications to reduce the fluid buildup and medications to suppress the vertigo. In some instances, about 20-30% of the time, medications may not be enough to control Meniere disease, and that's when we use procedures on the ear, and they could be either simple office procedures, like injection of material in the ear, or operating room procedures to stop the vertigo. The myth is that if you have Meniere's disease, there's no cure and there's nothing that can be done. And that is wrong because we can stop the vertigo from Meniere disease using a multitude of options. You spoke about the medical treatments. Are there any lifestyle changes which can also improve vertigo symptoms? Yes, I'm glad you asked because uh, particularly with Meniere disease, uh, stress is a big factor. So stress management is important. Diet is a big factor. We want the patient to be on a low salt diet to decrease the fluid buildup in the ear. Low caffeine, uh, no smoking, uh, low alcohol. These are all dietary and lifestyle changes. And there are things that can precipitate these attacks that we have no control over, such as changes in the weather. On a rainy, stormy day, like our typical Florida afternoons, a Meniere ear gets activated and the, you, the patient will feel the pressure build up in the ear because of the change in atmospheric pressure. You spoke about the relationship between vertigo and hearing loss. When you look at someone with the hearing loss as well as the vertigo, when, you, when they get those treatments, does that help with the hearing loss as well? So the treatment is going to address both the hearing loss and the vertigo the, and the tinnitus, hopefully. The tinnitus is the most stubborn of all the symptoms. Um, now, sometimes we use hearing aids as well, and sometimes we use implants. So just to clarify for people who are unaware, can you explain what tinnitus is? Tinnitus is the perception of sound in the ear. You hear a sound, 
that is not coming from an external source. It's internal. Nobody else is hearing it. It could be ringing. It could be buzzing. It could be a pure tone. It could be multiple tones. It is not speech or music. If you're hearing somebody's talking to you or you're hearing musical elements, that is a totally different category. That's auditory hallucinations, very different than tinnitus. Tinnitus is very common. We all are going to get tinnitus at some point because of degenerative changes in the ear, loss of hearing, etc. But there are disorders and diseases that can cause tinnitus. Meniere's, as we talked about, is one of them. Uh, an acoustic neuroma, for instance, that's a tumor of the hearing and balanced nerve. It could just present itself with tinnitus. Mild, just a ringing or a buzzing or a noise in the ear. People ignore it. Even physicians ignore it. Eventually, loss of hearing. Eventually, one recognizes that there's a tumor growing there. So tinnitus or hearing loss should not be ignored. Vertigo cannot be ignored because it really makes you sick. But tinnitus and hearing loss, people tend to ignore because, you know, I'm getting older, you know, I don't want a hearing aid. But the most important thing is find out why, find a diagnosis. The discussion of what to do about it comes next. We spoke about how sometimes dizziness and imbalance get confused with vertigo. Are there other diagnoses which cause similar symptoms that could be misdiagnosed as tinnitus? A tinnitus also is a symptom. Okay. So um, when you have tinnitus, it means something is wrong with your auditory system. It could be a brain tumor. It could be wax in your ear canal. It could be fluid behind your eardrum. So there's there are a lot of things that could cause tinnitus. Some of them mild and reversible, and some of them are chronic. Uh, the garden variety tinnitus that I talk about, uh, you know, from aging and so on, that's common, benign. It's very annoying. Uh, unfortunately, today, that kind of tinnitus still has no cure. And it's very frustrating to people who say, you know, I hear the sound in my ear. I wish it could be quiet. And there is no final definitive treatment for it. But we're doing research on this. And our, right now, we are running a research protocol of a medicine that we are injecting in the ear to hopefully stop that type of tinnitus. So, you know, stay tuned. There's research on tinnitus going on everywhere, and hopefully we will find a cure someday. So if a patient presents with tinnitus, what kind of testing is necessary, and what could a patient expect they would initially be tested for to rule things out? Because you said there are so many things that can cause it. Anytime you walk into a physician's office, there's something called the history, which means I will ask you questions about when and how and how often. That's called the history. From that history, we're going to decide, we're going to do the physical exam. Looking at the ear is going to give us a lot of information. Is there wax impaction? Is there inflammation? Is there infection? Is there fluid behind the eardrum? Is there a hole in the eardrum? All of these things can be seen just with a simple physical exam. After the physical exam comes the testing. And the main test is the audiogram. Audiogram is when we put you in a booth and we're gonna be presenting you with, with sounds and beeps and tones and words and check your hearing level and your level of speech recognition. Because loss of hearing comes in two flavors, a loss of volume which means giving you more volume you can hear and understand, or loss in volume and speech discrimination, which means even though you hear something louder, you still don't understand what the word or the sentence is. So we test for those. After the audiogram is something called the auditory brainstem response audiometry. That's like in the EKG, the electrocardiogram for the ear. It's going to measure the electrical impulses from the ear as they travel through the hearing nerve into the brain. 
and a test called electrocochleography checks those same electrical impulses within the cochlea, within the inner ear. So all of these tests are to tell us what is the status of the hearing system, of the auditory system, from the outer ear up into the brain. How common is the tinnitus? Because you said there's the garden variety. Everyone gets it at some point as they age. But how common is more severe tinnitus, like you're talking about where further testing is needed and, and treatment as well? You know, testing is needed at all grades of tinnitus because, because you want to diagnose a condition early, not late. So I would not wait until the tinnitus is severe to get tested. I would, I would test it as soon as you recognize it. Uh, treatment could be delayed if we say, well, this is a benign condition and we don't, you know, th th you could live with it. Masking is a big way to control tinnitus. Masking means um, confuse your brain, present your brain with other better things to hear, music, TV, uh, the fan, the refrigerator, anything that points away from your attention to the tinnitus is a good way to control your tinnitus. Uh, when it's severe, it has to be medicated. And unfortunately, sometimes it is very severe. And we've had unfortunate people who have committed suicide because of tinnitus. Fortunately, it is rare. But if one is, is getting there, most importantly, seek care. We can help before you get to that level. You spoke about the masking, that, that can be lifestyle choices. Is it similar lifestyle changes to vertigo that you spoke about before that you can also make to deal with some tinnitus? Stress, for example, uh, is a big um, enhancer of tinnitus. So uh, we do cognitive therapy for tinnitus. Uh, and cognitive therapy can be done by psychologists, by therapists, there are even programs on your iPhone that could help you with masking and cognitive therapy for tinnitus. So these are all lifestyle changes and brain over matter changes that could help people with tinnitus to cope with it. Now, I know we'd need a whole nother session to discuss the different kinds of implants that might be used and surgical procedures that sometimes are used for these patients experiencing vertigo and tinnitus. But because we have a few minutes, what are some of the most common ones that you present to patients or are good options? The procedures for vertigo are different than the procedures for tinnitus. Uh, if we are talking about Meniere's disease, for instance, and we treat Meniere's disease with procedures on the ear, the simplest procedure on the ear is uh, using steroids that are injected or placed in the ear through a mechanism called a microwick mechanism. Uh, the patient places drops in their ear. We had already placed a wick in the ear canal that transports those steroids towards the inner ear. If their, their, their Meniere's is steroid uh, responsive, then that enhances the hearing, decreases the tinnitus, and decreases the vertigo spells. Patients who do not respond to that, then they could have more invasive therapy. There's a procedure called the vestibular neurectomy, which we do successfully here, uh, that stops the vertigo and preserves the hearing. Um, office procedure-wise, there's something called gentamicin uh, treatment. Gentamicin is an antibiotic that is used because of its toxic effect on the ear. So gentamicin is placed in the ear to kill the cells in the inner ear that are causing the vertigo. So it's not used as an antibiotic, it's used as for its side effect. And that can help the patient avoid going into the operating room for the real procedure. I think what we're hearing here today is that there really are so many options for both vertigo and tinnitus and patients shouldn't suffer when, when it comes to having vertigo or tinnitus or, or both, 
they really should seek care sooner rather than later. That is true. That is true. And they seek they should seek care with specialists who handle those situations. And you know, unfortunately, um, people could get wrong advice because of misinformation. Uh, and as I said, uh, the people who have tinnitus and don't care for it because they were told you're just getting old, uh, that's bad advice. Uh, the people who are told you have Meniere's disease, there's nothing we could do, go and live with it, that's bad advice. And that is that is advice that's given by healthcare providers. So it, the, the problem is not only at the patient level, the problem is education at the healthcare provider level. And that's why sometimes specialist care is a better option. Dr. Jack Wazen, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion today. My pleasure. And as a reminder, we always encourage everyone in our community to visit smh.com to get the latest information from Sarasota Memorial. Have a great day.